Good morning, church, and happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I'm so glad you joined us this morning uh, for our Easter worship service. This is, as we've said many times, the, the strangest Easter in my lifetime, at least. I know there's been other ones, uh, but this is a strange one for us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus uh, from our homes. But I hope that you have joined us to celebrate and that you are celebrating today and, and know that there is victory over death in every way. Uh, if you're a visitor with us today, I'm so glad that so many have invited their friends to worship with us today. Uh, and will you just let us know that you're here with us, that you've worshiped with us today? You can either fill out one of our cards at, at letusknow.southwest.org, letusknow.southwest.org, or you can check in on Facebook, or you can put comments on our YouTube channel, uh, or just give us an email, email, shoot us an email, and let us know that you're here. Today, we will celebrate that death has been defeated, and we want you to celebrate with us. So a couple of reminders before we get into our worship service. Our church offices are still closed, and some have asked, when are we opening back up? Well, we just don't know right now. Uh, we are waiting on more instructions from the city, uh, and we will cooperate with city health authorities on when we'll open up our office, but you can still call, you can still email, you can still uh, get a hold of us in a lot of different ways. Our worship service for, the next, for next Sunday uh, is in the same boat. We're just not sure yet. So uh, we'll let you know. Keep on checking in with our, our website, in our website, on our Facebook page. And as soon as we know, we'll let you all know. Remember, you can uh, give online or you can mail your check in uh, to the church at, at our, our physical address. We're picking that up at the post office every day. That's at 4515 Cornell 79109. Or you can give online. And then always be looking for that midweek video from Brian and I uh, that we're having a lot of fun with. And then the Friday 5 email so you know what's going on uh, at Southwest. All right, so we're going to do some good on Easter and Easter the week following Easter as a church. We're doing a lot of good in our community, but we want to do something special together. We have one of our members. It's Paula Churchman's mom, Dorothy Franklin. And on April 24th, she turns 100 years old. Uh, and so we want to bless her and we want to inundate her with cards and calls. And so you'll see an uh, address right here that you can mail a card. So you can pause now if you want to and write that down. Uh, you can mail a card to Dorothy Franklin for her 100th birthday party. As you know, uh, many of our, uh, or all of our nursing homes and, and senior care homes are closed to visitors. So we want to be able to bless her on her 100th birthday with that. And then lastly, uh, don't forget our, two th our 2020 Bible Project. Uh, stay in it, family. Stay in it. Uh, you can even start in it now, uh, or you can, you can drill down a little deeper with some, uh, some commentaries and some other helps to, for you to study. So stay in the 2020 Bible Project. Brian will have another great lesson for us this morning, uh, and he, we're in 1 Samuel this week. So now for this morning's worship time. For the singing part, it's going to look a little different. My family's going to join me in this room, in our music room, and we're going to worship together. And we just ask, uh, as a family, uh, not all of us are here. Uh, our oldest is in Lubbock, as some of you know, but, but the ones that live in this house are going to worship together. Uh, and we have videoed that for you to worship along with us. And we just ask that you join in with us and worship with us. Worship the resurrected King with us. And we ask that you forgive our wrong notes and we'll forgive yours, we promise. Uh, just make a joyful noise to the Lord. Also, in our worship this morning, in a special Easter, Easter worship, you're going to see a lot of our church family uh, who have sent in videos telling us this week uh, what, what the resurrection means to them. So uh, I'm, <coughs> I'm excited to see a lot of those church families in our worship service this morning. And then uh, Jerry Morgan... Uh, one of our shepherds will lead us through a time of communion. And, of course, Brian will lead us in that 2020 Bible Project. And then another thing uh, for us as a church family, we are so thankful to have Craig Mashburn on staff uh, doing all the technology things that we need done to make this available to you this morning. So thank you, Craig. Uh, thank you for all the work you've been doing this week. So remember, pause when you need to, add worship songs, add prayers, add thoughts about what the resurrection means to you. Stay connected. Uh, check in on Facebook. Uh, email each other. Text each other. Call each other. Really, call each other uh, when you miss someone. 
And then again, I'll remind us to check your posture. Lean in. Don't sit back and consume, but lean in and worship the resurrected King this morning. Let's worship together. I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on Him are radiant, they'll never be ashamed, they'll never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me, and saved me from my enemies, the Son of God, surrounds His saints. He will deliver them, He will deliver them. Magnify the Lord with me, come and call His name together.
Hello, Southwest brothers and sisters. Charlotte and I believe in and we belong to Jesus Christ. We've been asked the question, what does the resurrection mean to you? It means to us, first of all, that our sins are forgiven. Secondly, we also believe that Satan's power uh, has been lost. And in the third place, we believe that we will be raised again to die no more, just like Jesus. This is a great thing to celebrate, and we want to encourage you to give thanksgiving to God today for these great blessings we have. Check it out in Romans chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We love you. When I hear of the word resurrection, I think of uh, toughness and love because he was super tough going through that, uh, through all the pain and suffering to uh, die for our sins. And you have to be super loving to like go through all that pain. And I think he wants us to live through him, through being tough and loving. Yeah, I think of the word love as well. Um, his love for me, his love for us, and the kindness that he shows us. And through his grace, that we know we have that promise that we're going to be with him in the end. And that gives us a peace, or it gives me a peace that I can really go through anything knowing that that promise is there and knowing that he's always going to keep that promise. Good morning, church, from the Thacker family. Happy Easter. I wanted to start out with a verse from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, 15 through 17. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one with a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. When I think about the resurrection, two things come to mind. The first is um, Christ dying on the cross and his blood and, and how it washes us clean. And we're not our past anymore. It doesn't matter what we've done. We are clean today, and he loves us more than he ever has. And the second is him raising from the dead, and that gives us hope for the future. We can have his kingdom here on earth when we walk with him and uh, have that hope. Church, we love you, and I uh, hope you all have a really happy Easter. The resurrection to me is confidence. Uh, I've been praying the Lord's Prayer a lot, that your kingdom come, your will be done. Um, and it's the same prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden after he prayed that all things be taken from him. He prayed, uh, your will be done. And so if Jesus trusted it in time, that was so hard for him. Um, it gives me confidence that I can trust God's will. Um, I can trust God fully. The resurrection for me, it means victory. It means that in a time right now where there's a lot of fear that we don't have to be afraid. It means that when we're experiencing a lot of anxiety um, or stress that we don't, have to, we don't have to have that. We have peace. Um, and it means that in a time right now amidst a lot of uncertainty um, that we can have certainty, we can have hope in what God has done um, and specifically what Jesus did um, in rising from the grave. Hey, church. Sure good to see you all. Well, it would be good to see you. You know, I hope the current state of things has helped maybe slow things down a bit. You know, our frantic pace often relegates Easter to just another day. But today, I hope you get to rest in the glory that is the resurrection. See, to me, the resurrection represents hope. Not just hope for some point in the future but hope for today. In Christ, we have the opportunity to walk upright without despair. And as the world around us feels more and more chaotic, we've been granted a hope that should empower us to transcend the norms of our time. You know, through the resurrection, we get to share hope with the world, and I can't think of a greater gift to share. Love well, my friends. I believe the resurrection means to me that Jesus will always be with us and never leave our side. And 
he proved that he was the one true savior and the one true God by conquering the grave and coming back to life. He is risen. He is, he is risen. risen. No. Lion, 
declared his grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the We hope everyone's doing fantastic. So it's Easter Sunday, and the question for today is, what does the resurrection mean to us? Well, for my family, it stands for truth. Truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross to wash away our sins, and on the third day he rose from the dead. But most importantly, we know that we are forgiven. We hope that you all have a great week. Stay safe, and we hope to see you all soon. Happy Easter. When you reach an age that many of your Christian brothers and sisters, relatives, high school and college classmates are passing away, you realize that your own death is not far away. I want to read from John in an answer that Jesus gave to Martha. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ and the Son of God who was to come into the world. Because we believe that Jesus is the Christ and that he lived, then we too can say yes with confidence, knowing that we will live again. For me, the resurrection means we don't have to fear death because death isn't the end. For me, the resurrection means that life never ends. Hello from the Johnson family in Canyon. Just want you to know we miss you all. You know, sadly, it's sometimes it seems to me that the ugly and destructive things that our enemy creates are winning. And I want with all my heart to believe that these things, while they're ever present, will not win. In the trial and crucifixion of Jesus, our enemy thought he had won. And his disciples were stunned and they were devastated. Jesus was killed? And it seemed so, but it was a lie. Three days later, Jesus not only rose from the dead with power, but he redeemed the very act of our enemy's malice to be the method by which he saves us, he won. You see, the enemy hadn't won, it just seemed he had for a time. And that message reaches forward uh, into my heart and declares that the things our enemy hurts us with didn't win, aren't winning, and will not win. I love the resurrection because it cries out the truth. I love the resurrection because God won. He's winning and he will win. Happy Easter. He is risen. For me, the resurrection of Jesus means that he really is who he says he is. And since that's true, I can trust that everything he said is true. For me, the resurrection represents a second chance that even though humanity has been caught in this endless downward spiral of sin there's we're not devoid of hope there's still a, a bit of hope left for humanity with the resurrection to me the resurrection means that we have a second life after this one with someone who cares about us and was willing to give his son on the cross to die and be resurrected again so that we can live with him again our church family from the mckinney family ava what does the resurrection of jesus mean to you 
that God loves us. I think for me, the resurrection is just the ultimate confirmation that God is really for us, um, that he really does want what's best for us and love us more than we could ever imagine. And it just gives me that security I need to, to really fully trust in him. The resurrection of Jesus means to me that the, the God of, of everything, who created everything, all of us, so big that he loves me that much, that he laid down a son for me and saves me, forgives me. Um, it's an incredible gift that he chose to do that so that he could live inside of each one of us. It's amazing. Do you want to say anything else? Yeah. I miss you. Hi. Hello. So uh, we were talking about what resurrection means for me or for us. And I think for us, Mainly it means we're kind of playing with house money. Uh, so we should be able to play the, the game of life with a lot of freedom because when Jesus resurrected, uh, we achieved, he achieved total victory. And so a lot of the anxiety and the uh, worry of the world kind of melts away because uh, the victory is already won. And so we should just live in joy and freedom. Hi church family, happy Easter. The resurrection of Jesus makes me happy because it means one day we get to go to heaven. Bye. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was lost.
to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am, just as I am, I would be lost, but mercy and grace, my free Church, Roger Gist here. I uh, wanted to talk to you this morning about what the resurrection of Christ means to me. Uh, there's many words I could use to describe what, what his resurrection means to me, but I, I think what captures it is, is just a feeling of relief, um, a, a weight lifted off of my shoulders. Um, Jesus won. Uh, when, when he died and, and rose again, he conquered sin, he conquered death. And uh, because of what he did, um, I am accepted, loved, and forgiven, and uh, I can live in that. Um, that's what the resurrection of Jesus means to me. Anyway, I uh, hope to see you guys very soon. I miss you guys. I love you. And uh, hopefully we'll be together soon. See you. Hey, guys. Uh, Gigi and Tom Tom here. Good morning. Um, so Doyle asked me, uh, what does resurrection mean to you? And, and uh, I've been contemplating it for a number of days. It's meant something different at different stages in my life. But right now we seem to be surrounded by death. And uh, it'd be easy for us to fall into despair. And that's, there's a picture of that in the New Testament. If you think of Jesus' disciples, they uh, followed him. He was going to be king, and then he was killed on a cross. Ha didn't they have to be in despair? They, they heard him say he would rise again, but they obviously didn't understand it. Uh, so when Mary came to the tomb and saw that he had risen, she went back to see Peter and the other disciples, and she was full of joy. So this time, resurrection means, for me at least, despair to joy. Have a blessed day. So for me, the resurrection of Christ means a second chance. But if you get more into it, it's the second chance for everybody. Before the resurrection, only God's chosen people had a chance of getting into heaven. But after the resurrection anybody could have the chance of going to heaven. So to sum it up, the resurrection after it, it's a second chance for anybody and not just a certain group of people. So to me, resur the resurrection means um, hope. Knowing that the same God that raised Jesus from the dead is the one who created us and that he knows the end of the story. So no matter what happens in this life, how stressful it is, we have hope knowing that he is in control. For me, it's about um, Jesus fulfilling the, all the promises. You know, he promised to give us eternal life, and by putting our faith in him, we would be rewarded. So the resurrection um, just kind of solidifies those promises and just fulfills them. 
for me, the resurrection means that Jesus leaving that tomb broke the bonds of sin and uh, Satan does not have a, uh, a hold on us anymore. We are free to uh, have the opportunity to go live with him in heaven someday. Well, good morning, Southwest family. This is Jim Brett, Terry, Cash, and Cooper Campbell, and we were privileged to worship there from 2000 to 2013. Doyle asked us to talk a little bit about what does the resurrection mean to us. And um, as I thought about it, it really starts for me with hope um, because of what Christ did on the cross and through his resurrection, um, we can have that same hope. And um, scripture says that he was the first to rise, but that we are always also brothers and sisters with him. Uh, and that we will rise again as well. And I think, uh, especially as we go through these times that we're experiencing right now, um, we need to hang on to that hope. And so we just pray that you have a blessed Easter, and uh, we love you all. Hi, everybody. We sure do miss y'all. We can't wait to be in fellowship with you again soon uh, to worship in person. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means to us he died for us. The thought of not going to hell, we go to heaven. Hope beyond this life. And to me, freedom in this life. Freedom from fear and worry. Uh, knowing that he's got this, he's already defeated death, and that we just get to live love. Y'all live loved. See you soon. Bye, everybody. From our house to your house, happy Easter. We're certainly living and experiencing a very, very unusual time. For most of us, this is nothing like we've ever seen before, a global pandemic that is affecting all our lives. Even before this event, though, it seemed that so many people, including Christ's followers, struggle with fear and anxiety. Contributing this is the constant input of news, most of which is not good news, to our television sets and our handheld devices 24-7. And the pandemic has just layered on top of that a blanket of concerns and fear. Fear of getting the virus, fear of someone you love getting the virus, fear of loss of health and maybe even life, fear of loss of our businesses, our income, our jobs, fear of not having enough, enough money, enough food, and apparently the greatest fear of all, not having enough toilet paper. When Jesus came and walked on the earth, 60 times tells us in the Gospels, that Jesus admonished, maybe even commanded people to not be afraid. The most common question that he seemed to ask his disciples and others was, why are you so afraid? He was constantly calling people from their fear to live in faith. Erwin McManus in his book, Uprising, wrote this, you cannot walk in faith and live in fear. You remember the story of Jesus when he was asleep in the bottom of the boat and they were going through that horrible storm and he uh, was awakened by the disciples and his response to them was, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? You see, when we live out of our fears, we don't live faithfully. And the more we live out of our faith, we don't live fearfully. So the question is, how do we live faithful, not fearful? especially in these times. I think the Apostle Thomas, known as Doubting Thomas, was an example of one who really struggled with a lot of fear and very little faith. The story is told in John chapter 20. You probably remember it well. When Jesus, just shortly after the resurrection, appeared to his disciples in the upper room one day, and this Thomas was not with them that day. When they told Thomas about that event, Thomas's reaction was, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, about a week later, Jesus appears again to them in that room. This time, Thomas is with them. And he looks at Thomas and he says, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. 
Several weeks ago, when we were in uh, the book of Joshua, you may remember when God tells Joshua, his new leader of Israel, to be strong and courageous, to not be afraid. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for be strong, which leads to that courage, literally means to fasten to or to take hold of. It's the idea that when you grab hold of something that we believe is fixed and it's permanent and it's true and it's anchored and won't give way and you hold on to that and you won't be afraid. I think that's exactly what Jesus is telling Thomas to do. Fasten to Jesus. Believing that he lives, that he has overcome the world because he can overcame the very worst thing this world has to offer, death. And don't let go of him. Some of you may have seen the 1996 movie Twister. There's a powerful scene at the end of that movie when uh, the characters played by Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton, who are storm chasers, realize they're right in the path of a tornado and they cannot avoid it. They see an old barn and they go inside the barn and they find a pipe and Paxton remarks that that pipe must go down 30 feet. And so they take these leather straps and belts and they fasten themselves to this pipe and they hold on. The tornado, tornado rips away the barn, but they survive. This movie seems a powerful reminder that we, as we live in the storms of life with the violent winds of death, of joblessness, of broken relationship, of sickness, of pain and suffering, and even a global pandemic, we need to fasten to something deep enough and strong enough to secure us and give us faith. And that something is actually a someone, the risen Jesus Christ. Now here's the hard part. To take hold of Christ, you're gonna have to let go of something, and that's your fear. If we're going to take hold of Christ, we have to let go of our fears. You can't have it both ways. In communion, we get a opportunity to re-experience this in a very practical way. You see, the bread we're about to take represents the body of Christ with its nail holes and its pierced side. So what I want you to do today is this. As you take hold of that bread, I want you to verbally acknowledge what fear you are letting go of. I want to challenge you as you go around the room, as you take the bread, to verbally out loud say this. Today, I let go of my fear of fill in the blank, and I take hold of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he had not risen, we would have nothing to anchor to. Inspire us today to let go of our fears and take hold of Christ, that we might live as courageous and faithful people, even today, to your glory. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Have a great Easter. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my Till all my fears are gone, I'm no longer safe to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer safe to fear. I am a child of God from my mother's womb.
drown in perfect love. You rescued me and I will stand and sing. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Now I'm no longer Well, church, this is not the Easter Sunday that any of us imagined being in, and it's sure not the one that we are used to or that we would have originally planned. And I, for one, I just want to confess, I have taken for granted our ability to come together in our shared space, our shared sacred space, if you will, where we get to join our voices together. And especially here on Easter, that just kind of makes it more obvious and so I got to tell you, I'm a little disappointed and, uh, and have some angst about this. And so I guess I just want to say that disappointment and that angst, you know, not just here for Easter, but about our current situation in general. Like I said, that Easter is just, just bringing to the forefront, making obvious today. That disappointment and that angst, that's real. And I hope you're making room for that. But I hope you'll also join me in acknowledging that the hope in the message we have to share that it's equally as real it's real too the easter message that is that message that's embedded in the resurrection of jesus that basically means that better is coming okay that's real and we believe this stuff we're not just playing church talking about the life death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, we believe this stuff and we think it works, that it is real and it is practical and it is enough to handle any situation, including the current situation that we're in. That's really the constant message of Christianity, you know, is the Easter message, that we always believe that better is coming, that that's the heart of God and that that's his promise. So we're never without hope. And I hope that that is uh, how you feel and that you'll join me in just delivering to each other. And I deliver to you today my Easter greetings as well. And to our Easter guests, I want to welcome you here today too. So the Southwest Church family has been engaged in a Bible reading and video watching schedule that we have called the 2020 Bible Project. And we've been really enjoying that. And I've been grounding my weekly teachings each week in some portion of the text that we read in the previous week. I thought this long about kind of pausing from that, taking a time out and jumping from where we're at in the Old Testament over to the New Testament to one of the four books that contain the story of Jesus and focusing on the resurrection because that would be appropriate today. It's Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. But I decided not. I decided to stay with our practice for two reasons. The first one is for our guests today. I want to tempt you by giving you a sample of what we're doing to join us in this Bible project. You can uh, find the schedule that we're following right here on this website where you're at right now. And it's not too heavy, but it's meaningful and it's significant. And if you go to that schedule, you can just click on the links and go straight to the videos that we're watching on some days or straight to the Bible text that we're reading on some days. And I'd love you to... Uh, to join us in that. And especially in these days where we're stuck, right, in very new routines, or some of us are actually just stuck in our houses. And uh, and so doing this practice each day, not only is it just beneficial in general, coronavirus or not, it's beneficial to know what the Bible's all about and to kind of capture the essence of the story of God and where we fit in it. But in addition to that, the discipline of following the schedule, the self-discipline, during this time has just been really grounding and elating for me in my day. Just like when I exercise, I feel better all day, even when I'm not exercising. Well, when I exercise my mind and my spiritual muscles uh, by engaging in this project, I feel better all day, even when I'm not reading or, or watching one of those videos. So I wanted to tempt you 
all to join if you haven't joined and just we've designed it where you can pick up right where we're at right now you don't have to go back to the beginning and catch up you'll benefit either way the second reason is because of where we're at in the story which is the beginning of this massive transition in the people of god's history of how god operates in relationship with that nation of israel the people of god and i'll talk about that briefly for context but really why I wanted to stick with it is for one special story right in right that's kind of the catalyst for this transition and it's in 1 Samuel chapter 1 that's where we're going to be and it's the little story of this godly woman's faith that is the pivot point for this massive transition in the history of the Jews and her story contains something very practical that I think uh, will be useful for you in the situation we're in that's really what I want to leave you with today but you'll also see in her story you'll see the easter message the hope message of life coming from lifelessness of hope coming from despair you know of of that despair and despondency being turned into thanksgiving and joy that's what easter is all about and you can find it right here in the story of hannah way back in the old testament so i can't wait to introduce you to this lady named hannah and her story, again, is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And so here's the context before we dive into this story. The people of God, remember, they're named Israel. We've learned that. They were rescued by God from slavery in Egypt. They were made into a nation called Israel. And then they were delivered by God into a land that is their own land. And so God has done a lot for them. And uh, we just finished the book of Judges, and in the book of Judges, we've watched this, it's really a tribal nation. It's a loose association of 12 tribes, all called Israel, okay? And we've watched them be led by 12 different judges in the book of Judges. Over the course of 350 years, these are civic and military leaders that would come in heroically and, and rescue Israel from oppression by other nations, but they really it really wasn't a great season because as the story progresses, Israel is spiraling down farther and farther away from their roots in God, okay? They really start, I mean, it gets really bad in, in there and it's characterized, the whole society is being characterized by the end of Judges and the beginning of Samuel as a massively self-centered group of people, horribly immoral, consistently violent and abusive and not just to their enemies but to each other and they've totally forgotten and dethroned God as their king. Judges itself kind of summarizes where we're at as we start for Samuel by saying in those days there was no king in Israel everyone did what was right in his own eyes and so it was it was really bad. So they're about to move into a time God's going to address this by moving them into a time where two new roles are created by God, that of prophet and king. So the prophet, their role will be to be, from this time forward, to be basically the spiritual conscience of Israel, constantly reminding the people of who God is, what he's done, and who they are as the people of God. And then the kings are the anointed leaders of this, these 12 tribes, now one nation, that's the intent, and their job is to ensure that the people are organized and operating according to the ways, the Ten Commandments, the way of God, and the will of God. Now, we'll get into later how good a job they've done that's, that's coming, but for now, that's enough to know that the book of 1 Samuel is primarily about three characters. The first prophet, this great prophet named Samuel, and then the first king of Israel, who he anoints as king, his name's Saul. And then the second king of Israel, who's also the most famous king. And he, through him is the lineage of Jesus Christ, uh, the King David. So that's where we're at. We're about to move into this, these really major characters of the Jewish faith that will be talked about to this day. But this massive confrontation of Israel and judges and where they were into this new massive move into an era that the Jews still talk about today. Um, it all is the catalyst for it is this story and it's centered on the desperate prayer and the faith of this woman, Hannah. So again, Samuel chapter one in the midst, remember we're in the midst of Israel being characterized by godlessness 
and we zoom in on the life of one little family that lives in one little small town in some hills in one of the tribes, okay, Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim. They remain very godly, this little family unit. We know this because year after year, this family would still travel to Shiloh, which is currently where the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God in Israel that everyone's forgotten, they haven't. Every year they go to Shiloh, they offer sacrifices with the help of the priest, Eli, who probably wasn't very busy in those days. And so he knew this family and they knew him and uh, they were very faithful and religious. So the man's name is Elkanah. And so the chapter begins by giving some important details. It says he had two wives, one was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Now you need to know that because back then having children was what gave a woman her value. Now we know better than that now and we know better than this, that having children back then was kind of the purpose of getting married for a man. And if, if his wife could not have children, he would often take a second wife. Even if he's too poor to do so, it was so important he would take a second wife. And that's probably what happened here with Elkanah when he married uh, Penina. But the text makes clear that this was very difficult for Hannah. Even though her husband adored her, really favored her over his other wife, um, she really struggled by not having kids. And to make matters worse, Penina, she would rub it in. So in the text it says, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. And then remember, Elkanah loves her. And so Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? You, why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Now, he, he meant well, but as the story goes on in this chapter, you're going to find out that Hannah's answer to that question of her husband was a resounding no, okay? You're going to see that she keeps going to God with her unique hurt and pain. All right, I want to pull over and park there for a minute because the first lesson I think that's worth mentioning from Hannah, especially to our young ladies listening today, is this. A man's love is not enough. Okay, I'm just throwing this in for free because I'm not talking about kids here for a minute. I'm talking about God. As a youth minister, I was a youth minister for 14 years and a lot of you in our youth group, I love you so much and we're friends. And I've, I've that's a message I want you to hear, young ladies, that you need God. That's what you need, your heart needs, your soul needs not a guy. You need God, not a guy. And it is crazy what I've seen young ladies do and some older ladies do in order to secure themselves with a guy because they think they need a guy. And sometimes they compromise God for a guy. And guys, there's an important application for here you for you too. Of course, you need God, not a girl. And it just reminds me what my friend Todd Brown always told me that stuck with me on this. You, this is my advice to you, run as hard as you can after God, okay? Then look to your right and look to your left and anyone that's keeping up, you're allowed to date, okay? Because what you really need is God. Um, countless people have learned this the hard way, either by the suffering of placing impossible expectations on their spouses and being constantly disappointed or through the suffering that comes sometimes by sticking with them or, or marrying them when they shouldn't, it, even if they're abusive. Or, or, and there's a lot of people who've suffered divorce because of this. So a special guy or a girl can be a blessing, but they cannot replace what and who you really need. And that's God. Okay, I'm just throwing that in for free. So I want you to see what happens when Hannah takes her downheartedness to God. Uh, remember, this is after years of hurt, years of hurt, of misery, of bitterness, and Hannah is not a happy, peaceful person. And it's all centered on, on her circumstances, just in her mind, not allowing for it. So let me read this to you. It's a little lengthy, but not too bad. Uh, starting in verse 9. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, 
O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, but her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the Lord God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in the Lord. Then, get this, then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Now, I want to stop there and I want you to notice something because this is really important, okay? Now, how Hannah has been described so far, I haven't read all these verses, but I went through. Here are the words in chapter 1 that describe Hannah to this point. Irritated, weeping, anorexic, downhearted, bitter, miserable, forgotten, deeply troubled, in anguish, and in grief. See, for her, all of those were a result of her, in her mind, not being able to have children. So you would think that this would all be relieved and she would come out of that funk by having a child, by praying to God and having a child. But now she's going to. She's going to have a child, and that's an awesome part of the story. But I want you to notice, this is before she has that child. And yet... She comes out of her, her funk. She comes out of being downcast. She starts to eat. She's, she's found some peace. And, and so my question is, she hasn't had the child yet, so how's she done it? How, how's she gotten that when the one thing that she thought she needed to get out of that funk, she hasn't gotten yet? She's made this trip to Shiloh, remember, for many years. And she may have prayed even many times, but she never left free of all of that irritation and anger that she's leaving with now. So what's different this time? Here it is. It's simple. She prayed, yes, but it's, she didn't just pray for a child this time. It was a woman who pointed this out to me, that the contents of this prayer is significant. And this was a woman who'd been in a similar situation to Hannah that pointed this out to me. Because we often need women to point out things as men that we wouldn't notice and we wouldn't think to notice because that's not our wineskin. We don't read from that point of view. But of course Hannah wanted a child. But she came out with peace this time because she committed what she was asking for from God to God. She said, yes, I want this child, but not for me. I will give this child to you. This will be for your glory. And so I'm happy to report that Hannah does end up having a son, and this would be Samuel, one of the greatest prophets in all of Israel and the man who God would use to initiate this major change that's coming and so needed. But the woman I told you about, she, she taught me that it wasn't the child that healed her heart. Her heart was already healed before the child came. It was the giving over of her life to God in prayer. It was her ability to pray differently and it reflected a real change in posture of her heart. Not my will, but yours, so to speak, which points us to Jesus as well. So the coming of Samuel, you'll read on. You can do that on your own. It did still bring her great joy, but the peace that she had didn't come from that. It came from her letting go of needing that child to belong to her rather than to God. So here's, here's what I want to leave you with today. And remember, worship doesn't end when this video stops. We want you to talk about this. And if you're alone, call someone and talk about this. Or just use these questions that I'm going to give you as some journaling material and have an intimate time with God, which would be great. So um, especially, I want you to talk about this. If any of these words that applied to Hannah apply to you in the circumstances we're in when they're not quite as ideal as we'd like them to be. Are you irritated? Are you bitter? Are you forgot, feeling forgotten? Are you troubled? Is there anything like that in you? So here's the questions. First, how would you describe your prayer life? 
Okay, how would you describe it? Just go around the circle in your family. Even if it's the first time you've talked about it, I want you to walk into that and just really enjoy a spiritual conversation uh, with each other. And if you don't have a prayer life, then you just confess that, just share that, okay? Second, I want you to share, if you have one, a memorable prayer experience from your past. It can be in a specific answer to prayer that is real memorable for you, or maybe it's just a prayer experience where your circumstances didn't change at all, but you came away like Hannah, at peace and feeling better. Uh, go around the circle and share that. And then finally, just really take off the mask with each other and just kind of check in with each other. How are you doing with all of that's going on in our world right now? Is there some built up irritation or anger or bitterness or weariness that's just really dragging you down? Just share that with each other. And then would you spend some time in prayer about that for each other and give God a chance to give you an experience like Hannah had where he can really connect to you, have some actual God contact through prayer and lift you out of your funk potentially or just maintain the joy that you have. I love you. Happy Easter. He is risen indeed.